<laughs> and I guess that's what started Steve on his career. <laughs> Well, I feel a little bit like what the Vice Admiral, who was Ross Perot's Vice Presidential uh, running <laughs> mate, uh, when he went up to his first uh, speech at the political caucus, he looked at the television camera and the people, he said, why am I here? <laughs> With this distinguished audience and these distinguished people on the panel, I kind of feel that way. But I'll give you just a few little vignettes of what life was like back in the 60s and 70s here in Sunnyvale, Milwaukee. Uh, before I came here, I was a naval aviator for four years, and I flew Lockheed P2Bs in training in Lockheed, the Super Constellations uh, radar configuration on the Pacific radar barrier from Midway to Adak, Alaska, a couple of wonderful places you probably don't want to visit. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, when I got out of the Navy, I took a uh, business degree at Menlo College, and when I finished there, I had several offers. One was from General Electric, but I figured I'd end up in Poughkeepsie, New York if I took that management training course. That didn't sound good. Or the telephone company in Stockton. And here was Lockheed, and I knew Lockheed, and I knew uh, several people who worked here, so I accepted an offer. When I uh, told uh, one of my professors, a finance professor, who was a retired Air admiral, that I was coming to work for Lockheed, he said, well, you kind of watch out, Roy, because, you know, that's a defense contract, and they don't last very long. Well, as Dave said, uh, we're 60 years and still counting, and uh, we're still here. When I was hiring in, and it, this was in the Palo Alto facility where the uh, uh, organization that I supported uh, was located, the main organization, said, you're going down to Sunnyvale, and you're going to work for a, a good guy. He's a young guy, 28 years old, his name is Dan Tell, and, uh, and he's going to be a vice president someday. This was in 1960. And at that time, there was exactly one vice president for Lockheed and all of Sunnyvale, Herschel J. Brown, who was the vice president, general manager of the whole outfit. So that was a pretty impressive comment. And uh, so I went down to Sunnyvale from Palo Alto, Time's up. <laughs> uh, it wasn't easy to get there because in July 1960, the uh, machinist union had uh, their first general strike at Lockheed. And when I came down the road, uh, there were all the strikers with their picket signs. There was the Sunnyvale police with their Doberman pinchers. Uh, this is the first thing for the city of Sunnyvale and the first thing for Lockheed up here too, though it was kind of interesting. So I got down there. They didn't have a desk for me, so since there are no hourly employees working, I took a dolly and walked the block to our reclamation area and grabbed myself a desk, <coughs> went back the block, and plopped myself down. Uh, let's show the first slide. This is a slide of the uh, thermodynamics department. This was actually done a couple years later several years later, but the people are about the same. And I, I bring this up because I just wanted to talk about the kinds of people and the culture we have been. Uh, today, a lot of the young movers and shakers, and we have at least one and more in this audience, were very young when uh, uh, things were developed here. But back in those days, we were coming from the aerospace, a young aerospace industry, from the airplane industry, and uh, people were older. In this particular case, Dan Pelt, the manager, was 28. We had about 50 engineers in the group. Of those 50, um, there was nobody 40 or older. There were about three people who were in their 30s, and all the rest were between 22 and 28. The other two, Dan, who was 28, he was the old man. Uh, out of that, we got about eight or nine managers or higher. Uh, Dave Kelleher, Herman Benton, he was a uh, department manager. Herman Bettencourt was a division manager. Ted Nast, uh, I'll get back to him, <laughs> and uh, a few others. This, there was a young fellow a couple of years out of Stanford, uh, just a young kid, about 23 or 24. His name was Mike Layden. And uh, 
He did okay. He ended up being vice president and assistant general manager of the missile systems division. Number two man under one, L. David Montague, who was sitting right next to us here. Unfortunately, uh, died an untimely death at a rather early age, or he probably would have even gone higher. Over here we have Ted Nass. I just want to bring that up. He came to work for Lockheed in uh, 1957. And I ran into him uh, last summer when I took a tour of the Advanced Technology Lab in Palo Alto at Stanford, or that uh, Lockheed has. And he's still there. Uh, 59 years later, he had progressed up to a senior member of the research laboratory. He's now working on uh, uh, cryogenic microprocessors, lead engineer. I mean, that he's never stopped. And a lot of the people here in that same way. And all of these engineers, whether they stayed in engineering or whether they went into management, they were on their own. They didn't have anybody who was a mentor, somebody who was 10, 20 years in the industry. There was no industry for re-entry systems or space cryogenics. So they were learning on the job. Uh, they were energetic, they were hardworking, they were smart, and uh, the company culture allowed them to do things that again, allowed them to fail, pick themselves up, figure out what was wrong, and go on from there. But, oh, this next, next one here is just to show you how big Lockheed was back in those days. What has it had progressed to? You can see our main campus here, all of, on the side is that entirely industrial complex. All those buildings, I counted how many buildings here were Lockheed buildings. 137. 137. We had progressed from zero. <laughs> in 1956. City of Sunnyvale had about 9,500 people in uh, the year uh, 1950. It had gone up to about 52,000 in 1960, and Lockheed had 20,000 in 1960. Uh, next, please. Uh, let's go back. No, that's out of sequence, actually. Um, I'm sorry, I just pulled up. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to say, yeah, there we go. Uh, in 1966, I was uh, asked to do the administrative support for the Electrical Engineering Organization of the Missile Systems Division. Everybody's here is perked up when I <laughs> said Electrical Engineering. Uh, this was a group of uh, division manager, three departments, about 400 engineers. Both Dave and Charlie were both in guidance and controls. Well, Charlie a little bit later, but Dave was the young engineer in guidance and controls organization at that time. And um, it was uh, really working hard. We were finishing up on the uh, Poseidon uh, contract, which was uh, we got after uh, A1, A2, A3 in Polaris. Uh, very dynamic. This was the 19 engineer a day time. Uh, the principal uh, desktop uh, system for an engineer was a slide rule. <laughs> And one of the great innovations we had during, I think, early 1967, we went from wooden drafting boards to steel drafting boards. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was great. I'll give you one other thing we had. We acquired a Mergenthaler diagrammer. How many of you know what a Mergenthaler diagrammer is? Ah, there's one. <laughs> well, it was a contraption they brought into our big bullpen area, 12 feet high, 6 feet wide. And it was considered maybe one of the earliest uh, CAD devices, the computer-assisted design. And it, it made uh, electrical uh, schematics, diodes, and computers, uh, transistors, wiring, things like that. Frankly, it didn't work very well. It was obsolete <laughs> in a very short period of time. You kind of had to kick it to make it work. But it was very interesting. And um, what, was, what was interesting, too, is I was there for 18 months. When I got there, we had a division manager in three departments. When I left 18 months later to go to uh, Missile System Division uh, Test Engineering, we had gone from 400 to 750 engineers. Just an amazing number. And uh, sometimes if we were hiring a new engineer, I would hope that another one would quit because I wouldn't have a place to put the new one on unless I had a new desk. But, but it was a great time to, uh, to be working for Lockheed. Unfortunately, about that time as we were finishing up with our work on uh, 
Poseidon and uh, the uh, Trident One funding hadn't completely come in yet, but we uh, were a little short of funds, and we had to lay off several thousand engineers, which was very traumatic, obviously for the employees who were laid off and for the corporation itself, because that's something that really wasn't our culture, one of the things we wanted to do. But we learned from it, and uh, that was the last time that we ever uh, manned up fully to our budget. After that, we used the subcontractors and people like that to make sure that we kept a more stabilized uh, workforce. Uh, let's see, let's go to, uh, no, it's one before that. Uh, going back, have I got the first one? Yeah, all right, that's fine, yeah. Um, Dave has talked about our culture here at Lockheed and how we work with our customer. And I got to say that between the culture, the new culture of Lockheed missiles in space, which is completely different from that of the old Lockheed and all of the old airplane industry as opposed to the aerospace industry, we had freedom to innovate, we had freedom to fail, we had freedom to do things that needed to be done, not just to follow the rules. We didn't have all of the stuff that the other companies had. And something I kind of bring that up is uh, Les Aspen, who was chairman of the House Armed Services Committee back in the 80s, and they did a complete review of, of the Trident program. And these are, uh, the things he said. Of all the strategic systems we have looked at, we've given the greatest, this one the greatest, the highest mark. He attributed Trident II's success to five factors. And you'll, you'll see them up there. Next. Yeah. Uh, again, the Navy program management created a no cover up culture, and that was Lockheed Missile Systems culture, too. We didn't cover things up, we worked hard. We did everything we could to make it right. And the, we weren't a company that was trying to, well, we can do this and save a little money. Just let's do it right and let's do it on time or even quicker than on time. Uh, and the program had continuity of management. We had that at Lockheed. Most of our Lockheed managers were there for quite a long time. And uh, it was the same way with the Navy. The Strategic Systems Office, the SSPO, who we worked for, had authority commensurate with its responsibility. Same thing with Lockheed. We tried to do that. The SBO had responsibility not only for the production of the Trident, but for its reliability and logistics as well. And the D5 program avoided novelty for its own sake. We were there to get the job done, to do it the best way we could, and uh, with the minimum amount of rules. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, the one other thing I would say is, uh, it may have been the other chart, is Senator Proxmire, who I'm sure many of you remember, and he was not a friend of Lockheed. Um, he had a lot of things to say, and some of the criticisms correct about our airplane programs. But he said, that this was the best run military program he had ever seen, the FBM program. And from a guy like that, that is really something. Well, I'd like to conclude just with talking just a little bit about how our Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, especially our missile systems uh, culture, finally got up to the top. And I think greatly influenced to the good for the entire Lockheed Corporation, which is now the Lockheed Martin Corporation. We put up five CEOs or, or uh, CEOs into the top spot. After Lockheed went through some rather traumatic problems in the 1970s <coughs> with the airplane side of our corporation, uh, and we had an interim president, uh, Mr. Hake, who was formerly the head of the uh, New York Stock Exchange, they selected uh, Roy Anderson to be the new CEO. And Roy was a California kid, grew up in Ripon, California went to Stanford, came to work for Lockheed Missiles and Space Company in Sunnyvale, 
uh, went up to the, became assistant uh, tech, or, uh, financial director here in um, Sunnyvale. Uh, then spent some time in um, <coughs> Georgia, at our Georgia company. Was brought there by Larry Kitchen and then up to the corporate headquarters, that time in Burbank, and uh, as assistant treasurer, and eventually uh, was selected by it to be the new uh, CEO and chairman of the board. After uh, he left, it went to Larry Kitchen. Now Larry uh, had originally been a, uh, after a Marine Corps stint, had gone up at as high as a salary grade 13 in the civil service. Uh, he, was chief of he was chief of staff for an admiral. Came to work for Lockheed uh, on the logistics side. Larry didn't actually have a college education, but extremely smart. And um, after a while, and in some logistics days, uh, <coughs> he asked the president of, uh, actually, the chief engineer at that time, Bill Stevens, he says, I want to get in the management rotation program because there's a lot of things I want to do. He says, and if I don't do well, you can fire me. And Stevens says, okay, it's a deal. So he went through a number of control areas, management areas, ended up uh, uh, being uh, actually assistant uh, general manager of this assistant venture under uh, Bob Furman. And Bob, when Bob Furman went to um, later on to Georgia as uh, president, he took uh, Larry with him as an assistant. Uh, and when then, when Bob Furman went on to be president of the uh, California company, uh, Furman, or I should say, Larry Kitchen took over as president of the Georgia company, which built the C5A. And uh, then he succeeded Anderson as uh, chairman and CEO of the Lockheed Corporation. And uh, Bob, you know, then Bob Furman actually had come down from Georgia and become executive vice president here at LMSC. And then he, uh, Larry brought him back up to the corporate headquarters as uh, president, actually vice chairman, I should say, and chief operating officer of the company. They were both about the same age, so they retired at the same time and brought up Dan Tellum, who's one of our greatest CEOs. Uh, he had a, of course, came up through Lockheed, as I've mentioned. He was chief engineer of the Missile Systems Division, vice president and assistant general manager in the Aeronautics Division, uh, and then president of Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, and group vice president before he went down to Calabasas, which was our new headquarters. He had quite a uh, time down there, did an excellent job. There was a corporate raider you may have heard of, uh, uh, Simmons, who tried to take over the company and probably would have completely ruined it if he had. Lucky, uh, but uh, Dan stood firm and he bested him. And knowing that later on that we really had to consolidate the aerospace industry, he initiated uh, our combination with uh, Martin Marietta, which became the Lockheed Martin Corporation. And then Dan was the first chairman and CEO. After him, uh, Norm Augustine, who had been chairman of uh, Martin Marietta, became chairman. But after that, he went back to LMSC again with Vance Kaufman, who uh, had spent most of his career here in Sunnyvale. Uh, when we hired him in, he says, yeah, but I want to go through your uh, graduate training program. And he struck a hard bargain. He spent six years getting his MS and PhD at Stanford. Ended up being uh, president of the uh, space systems division here at Lockheed. And then from there went down to be our chairman. So um, <coughs> there's just one other thing as I finish up, I thought, it was kind of interesting. Back in 1956, uh, we'd just come up here, and we knew we had to have a test space to test the Lockheed uh, the Polaris motors and ordnance. So we wanted to have uh, some kind of a test space probably up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So Art Hubbard, who was uh, one of our great engineers and managers, ended up being vice president here. That time he was a young man who was uh, designated to be the new uh, 
manager of the test space, which hadn't even been built. In fact, we didn't even have the property yet. So they set him up with another uh, fellow to reconnoiter the Santa Cruz Mountains. And uh, he was walking up in the area and came across a lake, which is now right in the middle of where we have our area. And um, I'll just read a little something that I found. Uh, those of you who have enjoyed a meeting with barbecue at the lake at the Santa Cruz test space will maybe be surprised to learn that the custom precedes Lockheed's ownership of the 4,000 acre, actually 4,400 acre, uh, atop the Santa Cruz Mountains. In the fall of 1956, Art Hubbard and Ralph Bryant were investigating the site potential in the guise of hikers. At the lake, they came across Father Gover Hubbard, the glacier priest. Uh, those of you, some of you may know who he was, and I'll explain that a moment later. And he was up there with a group of nuns, and they were having a picnic on the lake. And uh, they met uh, Art and uh, the other fellow Lockheed employee, and they invited them to join them in the picnic. And this was the first of the Lockheed picnics. Since that time, uh, many Lockheed families have been privileged to come uh, up to the lake and uh, have a barbecue or a picnic at the lake. And uh, I think they're still doing that today. And uh, just as a personal comment, a personal preference, I might say I was able to be up there at one time and I, my daughter, who whose birthday is today, when she was four years old, caught her first fish <laughs> at the Lockheed Lake at the Santa Cruz Mountains. So, and today is her birthday, so happy birthday, Christina. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, one other thing I would like to mention, something I got some of my material from a book, which I highly recommend. It's called Beyond the Horizons, The Lockheed Story by uh, Walter J. Boyne. And it takes Lockheed from 1932, when the Bro uh, Gross brothers bought the company up to when this book was written about 1998. It's a good book, tells us the history of the whole cooperation. Thank you, Dan.